Namaste. Rajiv, uh, there is a cultural um, revolution going on, awakening going on. And as part of that, there is a debate uh, on Twitter and social media platform. One particular debate is on the topic of Raja Ramohan Roy. I know you've done some work on it. So I wanted to first ask you uh, when and what made you um, interested in Raja Ramohan Roy? Good point. You know, uh, I my book Indra's Net refutes the Western Indology thesis on what they call Neo-Hinduism, which they mean by which they mean that Hinduism, modern Hinduism is a recent and a fake construct. It's an artificial construct made up in the last 200 years, not connected with Vedas. And the allegation is that, you know, the nationalists uh, starting in Bengal and other places uh, wanted to kind of create a national religion for India. And uh, they took a lot of ideas from Christianity mm -hmm. and they put them in, put it in Sanskrit and uh, came up with a few, mixed it with a few uh, old Vedic ideas and that became uh, Hinduism. So they call it Neo-Hinduism. So I wanted to refute that and I believe that first you have to study the opposing side. So I went and read a lot of their uh, articles and papers and books and all that. They've written lots on Neo-Hinduism and it always starts with Ram Mohan Roy as the founding father of this new Hinduism, they felt that he is the one who created these ideas in the first place. So this is how my interest in Ram Mohan Roy started. Now, once I started looking at him, I realized that uh, he was an employee of the East India Company. Uh, Ram Mohan Roy was an employee of the East India Company. In Calcutta. In Calcutta. This is a, a very interesting thing. And he was, uh, he worked on both sides. You know, he was patriotic, he loved his culture, he was certainly a very proud Bengali. Uh, his ideas on Hinduism were mixed up. Mm -hmm. I don't think he understood Hinduism very well because he was against Murti Puja, the Christians couldn't stand idolatry, so he went along with that. Uh, on certain things he was good, he did some good work also. But you know, he was primarily negotiating within the framework of the East India Company rule not fighting that they should, we should get rid of them, but within the scope and umbrella of the East India Company rule over India, he was negotiating that it, Indians should get a better deal. Mm -hmm. So he was sort of the Indian working within the colonial camp, trying to get them a better deal. So he was working on both sides and you have to give him credit for a lot of good things he also did. Mm -hmm. He was a close collaborator of William Carey, a very notorious Baptist evangelist who started the Serampore seminary mm -hmm. and uh, known for all his Hindu phobia. Mm -hmm. And in many occasions and multiple times in his life, he collaborated with him. Okay. And he, uh, uh, Roy uh, eventually moved to England mm -hmm. and that's where he's, he died and that's where he was buried. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, at the uh, coronation of the British ruler, uh, he was invited to sit along with heads of state. Okay and ambassadors of various countries. He was given that stature even though he was not. He was a private citizen working for the East India Company. But the British really liked him and he converted to a Unitarian, the Unitarian Church mm -hmm. and they considered him a major catch because he was, here is this guy, you know, upper caste, very well spoken, knows different languages, can speak as a, uh, he can speak, uh, you know, all kind of, uh, he can wear the identity of, uh, you know, he's speaking in, uh, uh, in be uh, behalf of Sufis or behalf of Vedantins or Christians, he could swing here and there. So he was a, an interesting person to study. And the allegation is that he started Hinduism with his own hodgepodge, what we, what we call khichri, mm -hmm. a mixture. <laughs> Uh, he started this thing, what today we would say is a muddled up sameness idea. Mm -hmm. He started that and uh, they say that this is the origin of modern Hinduism. So I, I was very interested in understanding this. But what troubled me about him mm -hmm. is that he is the source of this idea that Sanskrit should be replaced with an anglicized education system. And he had a lot of, he is the one who started this whole campaign in England to convince them that they should desanskritize India's education. But why did he focus on Sanskrit per se? Interestingly, he writes a letter to the Governor General of India in 1823. Okay. Uh, and it's a very interesting letter in, in which he argues why, uh, you know, keeping Sanskrit is a bad thing. It'll, uh, the natives will remain in darkness. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't have rationality and logic. It doesn't have science. Uh, uh, and uh, things like uh, 
the he mentioned uh, vyakaran and the problems of you know nitpicking grammar and all that is no use uh, he mentions uh, nyaya that is of no use to, uh, to people uh, uh, he talks about vedanta so he talks about various aspects not some kind of name dropping buzzwords i'm not sure how much he really understood those mm -hmm. because if he understood those he would not feel this way okay uh, so he argues and i want to uh, quote from his letter this is a this is a <clears throat> this is kind of i'm taking a, the, the conclusion of his letter his conclusion is this the sanskrit system of education would be best to keep this country in darkness if such had been the policy of the british legislature mm -hmm. but as the improvement of the native population is the object of the british government it ought to promote a more liberal and enlightened system of instruction embracing mathematics natural philosophy chemistry and anatomy with other useful sciences which may be accomplished by employing a few gentlemen of talents and learning educated in europe okay okay in representing this subject to your lordship i conceive myself discharging a solemn duty which i owe to my countrymen mm -hmm. i'm doing it on their behalf of our fellow indians mm. and also to that enlightened sovereign which is the king of england and legislature the parliament which have extended their benevolent cares to this distant land actuated by a desire to improve its inhabitants oh okay so you know this is this is so typical he is the prototype brown type mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i mean this is the typical sucking up to these guys you know i'm so grateful come and help us we are not civilized you please help us out and all that and the, you know the british had been talking all these things but now for the first time is a very powerful eminent highly regarded you know gentleman from india uh, learned fellow brahmin upper caste all those an elite selling out right. so he starts a whole new trend in the colonial uh, enterprise so we've been blaming macaulay uh, you know uh, a lot for our uh, desanskritizing of india so i guess he plays a big role too so lord macaulay's notorious speech in parliament which all of us quote comes 12 years after okay. ram mohan roy writes this letter to the prime minister asking that sanskrit be replaced with english education interesting okay so uh, you know it's a it's a great gift to somebody like macaulay he he he's having a ball he's saying okay now one of those guys <laughs> wants it so why no we should give it to them we should right. help them out you know that right. kind of thing and the sad thing is sanjeev sanyal whom i think is a good guy otherwise but misinformed on certain matters in his book he actually supports this idea and argues that the reason this great indian civilization at one time collapsed is because of sanskrit right. because sanskrit is very rigid doesn't promote freedom uh, it, it, you know you cannot the you, same nitpicking same grammar same nitpicking this grammar is too rigorous you know you need freedom you need to get out of this and so uh, the rise of the civilization the renaissance depends on english and importing uh, english ways british ways okay no i want to follow up and ask you so how did this desanskritizing of india begin and you mentioned sanjeev sanyal briefly but and what is the legacy of this uh, i'm assuming is there a, a, a bengali legacy to it where bengalis are rejecting it uh, more uh, what's the legacy of this well you know uh, the british empire was headquartered in calcutta in dhaka the whole bengal area so obviously that's where the influence was the greatest and then then it goes to your uh, hometown of uh, you know madras <laughs> and they get the madras presidency so uh, uh, you know punjabi is also sell out later okay. you know also sell out i mean we all have this you know we we should not be ethnically you know you know i'm this bengali first or i'm this punjabi first and all that let me tell you <coughs> since you raised this issue of uh, you know bengal let me tell you this i have tremendous respect for bengalis like ramakrishna vivekanand aurobindo sri prabhupad mm -hmm. rupa goswami and his nephew jeeva goswami mm -hmm. brilliant brilliant and i have spent more time quoting these people working on them writing uh, with them i have excellent relations with the, with these lineages 
So it's not about a Bengali non Bengali. Mm-hmm. It's just that you know you have to look at each person and their stand. Mm-hmm. I mean, I I, I love uh, you know Subhash Chandra Bose. I was at, I was invited to give the main address by General Bakshi in Delhi at the anniversary there. Mm-hmm. So I have tremendous respect for those who respect the dharma and the Vedic tradition. And I am able to criticize those who don't. Mm-hmm. It has nothing to do with ethnicity. Right. So uh, this business that you know uh, Bengalis close ranks uh, is kind of a shame. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, as a Punjabi, okay, I, I like my uh, you know uh, alu paratha and uh, you know chola bhatura. And uh, once in a while, I'm in the mood to do a bhangra. I'm not very good at it. <laughs> But you know, all that's okay, but I would never say Punjabi first. And I would never say that somebody who's a Punjabi must be right. I, mm-hmm. de- I just don't, you won't see me doing that. Mm-hmm. And when I go to India, I don't go hanging around uh, Punjab. You know, I may have gone there three, four times in the last 10, 15 years. Mm-hmm. But every single time I go to India, which is four times a year, I go to the South. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I have visited the South 10 times more often than I visited Punjab. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I, I think that we should get out of this narrow minded ethnic identity as our primary identity. Yeah, right. So I'll clarify what my identity is. I believe that primarily the most deepest foundation I should have and I want to have all the time is Vedic Yagna. So I'm my deepest quest is to be in the Vedic Yagna. Mm-hmm. That's beyond borders. It's a universal thing. Universal thing. Mm-hmm. To implement this Yagna, we need Bharat Rashtra. We need a vehicle and Bharat Rashtra is the second part of my identity because it's a vehicle we need. And the Rashtra needs a Rajya. So the Rajya is a means to an end. The Rajya, I don't support this guy or that guy for the sake of it. I support him to the extent they're helping the Rashtra and not otherwise. Mm-hmm. And in this business of first the Vedic uh, Yagna, then the Rashtra, then the Rajya, there is no Punjabiness there. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is true. Mm-hmm. And so it, it troubles me when people say, oh, you know, you are for Bengal, anti-Bengal. I never, I don't even think that way. Mm-hmm. So that's my answer to whether the Bengalis should be blamed or not blamed. I think, I think uh, coincidentally, because the British landed there, mm-hmm. uh, the, the uh, majority of the people in the early you know, couple of centuries were Bengalis who mm-hmm. the British uh, got to know and got and traded with and so on. So that is where the uh, proverbial Brown Sahib was born. Okay. And then spread across. You talked about de-Sanskritizing of in, in India, but uh, you also mentioned in one of your tweets about um, the Sanskritizing of Europe. So how did that happen? So this is very interesting. Uh, in the early 1800s, while thanks to uh, Ramon Roy and uh, Macaulay, uh, they are desanskritizing India's education. At the same time, in parallel, major European universities are creating Sanskrit chairs. They are bringing Sanskrit into their ed- system because they know it's a gold mine of knowledge in the Shastras. So this data mining of Shastras starts in the 1800s and universities in Germany, France, Britain, they start introducing a lot of Sanskrit, Sanskrit studies. And you know, this is how a whole lot of uh, knowledge gets transferred and turned into Western intellectual property. And I'm writing several books on the, the uh, origins of uh, a lot of the Western thought, mm-hmm. a lot of Western thought. Actually, it goes back even further, mm-hmm. but it got a big boost at that time. Mm-hmm. Because prior to then, they were taking knowledge like botany, you know, and they were taking the actual empirical data on botany and trying to uh, make it into their own. Mm -hmm. But the Sanskrit texts were not very accessible to them. Mm -hmm. But this, in this era, from 1800 onwards, the rise of Sanskrit in Europe, corresponding to the decline of Sanskrit in In India, India. was a huge, it's a huge story that needs to be told. And Mm -hmm. I'm writing multiple volumes of that. Now, do you think India could have become uh, scientific and modern with sans- Sanskrit, if they hadn't de-Sanskritized India, do you think we would have still been, you know, m- a modern nation? So that's a that's an important question because a lot of the people criticizing me are saying that okay, Ramon Roy was right because you know it, it, otherwise we could not have become sci- scientific. But let me tell you, Ramon Roy wrote this in 1823. Uh, you know, uh, 150, almost 150 years later, we got independence. So it's not as if it produced some immediate result. Mm-hmm. And during that period, we, we, the British didn't help us become very scientific. It's mm-hmm. only after independence. So this business of sacrificing Sanskrit and in order to get English didn't really do that job. Uh, but look at Japan, which is very scientific. Look at China, which is in Mandarin, 
very scientific. Uh, they did not give up their native tradition, native language in order to anglicize for the sake of becoming scientific. Now, these civilizations also were lagging behind Europe in science. Japan and China were not on par with Europe as far as science is concerned, just like India wasn't. Okay, But their rise to scientific prominence today was not based on becoming anglicized. So, the, 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 you cannot say that becoming anglicized is a necessary condition for becoming scientific. I think that thesis is false. Uh, Ramon Roy was false. Macaulay was false. Sanjeev Sanyal is false. M many other people who are saying this are false. Sanskrit, in fact, is a source of knowledge which the Westerners took. A whole mm -hmm. lot of knowledge on many different areas. And Sanskrit is still not properly mined for its Vedic scientific knowledge. Okay. Uh, so, Rajiv, you also mentioned about uh, uh, Bengal and, the, and Madras presidency. Is there, was there a uh, Raja Ram Mohan Roy of the Madras presidency? The, the British, did they also play havoc in the Madras presidency to de-Sanskritize the Tamil mind? You should answer that. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 uh, I, haven't, uh, uh, I haven't done as much work on the Tamil, uh, you know, you see, it's very interesting. The identity crisis in Bengal of uh, am I Indian first or am I Bengali first mm. and the one in uh, Tamil Nadu, Nadu am I Tamilian first or am I Indian first, both need to be studied, mm -hmm. both need to be studied. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, as a Punjabi, uh, uh, I can just bring in a, some, an analog, uh, Punjab was partitioned into the western side which is about 60% of the land went to Pakistan in 1947 and a smaller piece of land came to India because of Muslim Hindu divide mm -hmm. that the British did. And Bengal had been partitioned into West Bengal Hindu and East Bengal Muslim, Muslim. Mm -hmm. in the early 1900s by the British. So the partition of Bengal and the partition of uh, Punjab are both for Hindu Muslim but, you know, reasons, mm -hmm. both done by the British. But the one in Bengal was done much earlier. Mm -hmm. So you would have thought that the Bengalis separation from the Muslim side would have happened more completely mm -hmm. and, uh, than the Punjabis. But you know, in Punjab, there is no movement that says, you know, those guys across the border are bhais because they're Punjabis mm -hmm. and we all eat, uh, you know, makki roti and saag and we can do this bhangra together and we speak Punjabi. So what, so what if they're Muslims and so what if they're Pakistani, they're our brothers and they're, we are, we'll let them smuggle in illegally across the border. Mm -hmm. There is no movement like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, Punjabi, Hindus and Sikhs are very clear that we are Indians first. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is, there is absolutely no doubt that uh, language and ethnicity will override, uh, you know, patriotism. Mm -hmm. But this is somehow the case in Bengal. And I think this is a topic of Bengalis should study this, mm -hmm. should study their own history as to why is this so. And I think Tamilians should study this about Tamil Nadu. Why is it so? Is it a British influence? Because those were the two states that were colonized the longest. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Okay. But I'm not sure what the reason is. Okay. We will look forward to further research from scholars in this area. Thank you so much, uh, Rajiv. Thank you. Uh, it was very enlightening, Thank as you. always. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you for watching. You can subscribe here and also hit the bell icon to make sure you get notified. To donate, please click this button.